So there is a new study published in Psychiatry Research that's concluded that many psychiatric diagnoses are scientifically worthless as tools for identifying discrete mental health disorders. This study comes out of the University of Liverpool, and it involved a detailed analysis of five key chapters of the latest edition of the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and it focused on schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, and trauma-related disorders. Now, this research study, their main findings was that psychiatric diagnoses all use different decision-making rules. There is a huge amount of overlap in symptoms between diagnoses. Almost all diagnoses mask the role of trauma and adverse events, and the diagnoses tell us little about the individual patient and what treatment they need. And those key findings led the authors to conclude that the diagnostic labeling represents a disingenuous categorical system. Emma Kate, you you know just completed your PhD. I'm sure you covered a lot about diagnoses, assessments, and just even using the DSM as a as a manual. What do you make of this study? So right off the bat, when I was prepping for this, I there's some there's a lot of truth to this, but I do have things that I disagree with. So. Our diagnostic system in in terms of the DSM is absolutely flawed. It's not perfect. Um, However, I felt the language that it's completely meaningless was a little strong because the reality is there are pros to providing a label um, as well as acknowledging stigma is a true issue. Um, We, you know, when we have collaboration between professionals that are providing treatment and services, it, it provides some ease of discussing what's going on and somebody can say, oh, this person is struggling with ADHD. All right, we know what that looks like. We It's just a, a simpler way of talking about it. Also, having a label can help people figure out how to get access to services that are going to be best suited to them and also can be really empowering. So I work a lot with kids and adolescents, and I think especially for some of my kiddos that um, are finding out that they're on the autism spectrum it, it helps them say, oh, I, I'm not alone, and this makes sense why I've had these struggles. At the same time, in my professional practice, I do testing, and my background is school psychology, and the diagnoses that are provided, especially for testing, stay with you forever. They are in your permanent record, and oftentimes we start to incorporate them in our identity. So we we have to be careful, and, and typically, myself personally, if there's enough evidence, I'm going to give somebody a diagnosis to allow them to access services. You need to be able to get services that you wouldn't otherwise be able to to have. And that's, so this is long-winded, but I, I feel kind of strongly that the language in this particular article was strong. I agree that they can be really stigmatizing, and that's why it's important to be cautious in how you present these things to people and try to focus on strengths without minimizing the negatives. So long-winded, parts of this are true, it's not perfect, we still have work to do. I would add to that that I I wish they had studied autism spectrum disorder because I don't think the language is strong enough that that is a trash, just a trash diagnosis. It is not measurable, it's not objective, um, and the descriptors of uh, kind of the different levels. There's a level one, two, and three, with three being the most severe. And they say that um, kids would still be able to receive this diagnosis, but I'd say probably around 55% of my kids would no longer qualify. But I, I think that absolutely is a trash diagnosis. And I, and I do think this particular study, the actual diagnoses that they were looking at matters. Um, so, I, again, I don't know how these results would completely translate. They probably would to an extent, but not sure how much they would for other potential diagnostic categories. You know, one thing that strikes me about this is psychiatry is almost in its infancy. And as with a lot of things in the world of the humans, the areas where we're on the most shaky ground are the areas where people tend to be the most uh, strident and doctrinaire. And so you find this in psychiatry a lot, and I'm not trashing psychiatrists, but they, they get very definitive about a diagnosis. And the truth is the state of the art with diagnostic stuff is not great, 
right? So there probably are real things. I mean, like schizophrenia is probably a real disease process of the brain. There, uh, OCD, um, even bipolar disorder. But the ability to kind of say, like to use Frank's example of this, um, a lot of times you'll have people present with who are just not neurotypical people. And they've got OCD related symptoms. They've got anxiety, broadly speaking. They've got ADHD looking stuff. They've got social. And depending on who you happen to get to and what their areas of expertise are, that's what the diagnosis is going to be, right? They're going to, they're going to see it through their lens. So I think the, the, the point of the, of the piece that I take away from and I agree with is we're just not at a good spot in terms of being real, like not at a take it to the bank kind of level of specificity with diagnostic stuff. It's not to say that there's no such thing as fill in the blank, you know, a certain diagnosis. Now there might be some that are in the diagnostic manual that are really just social constructs and they're not real things in terms of a, you know, a true um, disease or disorder process. But even in the ones that are, I mean, you'll, I know some, some psychiatrists, not to call anybody out, but almost like 80% of the people they see, they diagnose them as bipolar. Um, well, that's just not, like, if we're in, if we're still in that boat where we can't get past that, where we can't make distinctions between this is bipolar, this is not, this is just normal adolescent mood swings. This is anxiety related stuff. That's, I think the point is that we're not, Mm -hmm. we're not good at it yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I will comment too. I think one particular angle that this article was referencing was the trauma piece. And, Mm -hmm. and if you see a provider that doesn't have a strong trauma background or training, it makes sense that you wouldn't pick up on that. And you might get labeled with something that isn't quite accurate or the root cause of, of what's going on. So I, I liked that. Yep. Right. And you think about the impact that trauma has on people and you could go down a list of, it looks like ADHD. It looks like anxiety and it is anxiety. It looks like depression. It looks like behavioral, pro- like it, it, there are all these different th- ways that it can show up. And depending on someone's bias, they might latch onto, this is really an anxiety disorder, or this is really, you know, a conduct disorder or whatever it is. And so that, that's part of what, what, what this is trying to get at. It's not to say there's no such thing as a, as a psychiatric condition. It's just that we're not good at the diagnostic consistency. I think that's fair to say. Thanks for watching this Being Human segment from the Shrink Tank podcast. To watch the full episode, click here, or to check out previous episodes, click here.